Greetings and Shalom. Now we have the article banned in the USA state laws supercharged book suppression in schools. Hmm. I wonder why. Because of the Great Awakening. Many people are awakening to certain truths or the knowledge of the truth, whatever belief system that you're in, that the world is corrupt, or at least in the U.S. or Western world, we're heavily indoctrinated in these schools. And even in the churches as well, but more specifically when it comes to the knowledge of the truth or the knowledge, it's not going to be taught by your parents or the schools or your religious system. You're going to find this information most likely on YouTube or some social media platform. That's how I was awakened and started a journey of book hoarding and studying and you know, pretty much self-evaluation. And self-evaluation is a key component of recognizing your faults and your errors and your ways. But we have to be man enough to admit that, hey, I've been taught in error or I've been wrong. And to be humble and meek about it. And yes, we will change, but it takes time. So the article states 2022 through 2023 school year has been marked to date by escalation of book bans and censorship in classrooms and school libraries across the United States. Pan America recorded more book bans during the fall 2022 semester than in each of the prior two semesters. This school year also saw the efforts of new state laws that censored ideas and materials in public schools. An extension of book banning movement initiated in 2021 by local citizens and advocacy groups Broad efforts to label certain books harmful and explicit are expanding the type of content suppressed in schools. Again and again, the movement to ban books is driven by a vocal minority demanding censorship. At the same time, a 2022 poll found that over 70% of parents oppose book banning, yet the bans continue. Many public school districts find themselves in a bind. They are faced threats and political pressure along with parental fears and anxiety surrounding the books on their school shelves. School boards, administrators, teachers, and librarians are told in some cases to err on the side of caution in the books they make available. Too often, they just do that. So now we're at the book, The Negro Rulers of Scotland in the British Isles, and here's one example of them trying to book band. This is page 113. In order to hide the origin of Western civilization, some scholars have went as far as to rename Northern Negro Africa, where civilization began, to the name Middle East. This was done in hopes to reclassify the black Northern Africans who invented the world's first philosophy and mathematical sciences to be Caucasian. Those who believe this manipulative hoax are in cahoots with an old continuous international conspiracy to erase or eradicate black people from the pages of history. In the British Isles of the late 20th century, history books involving the African contribution of Europe were prohibited from entering the United States, with the exception of those texts which only exemplified slavery, savory, crime, and poverty. This also included historical books that exposed the Black Caesars, Pharaohs, Empress, Cleopatra, Sheba, the military genius Hannibal, and the royalties of Scotland and the British Isles, French, Portugal, Spain, Scandinavia, etc., etc. Euro books that represented the highest level of black achievements were stamped in the rear and side cover do not sell to the United States of America. And why is that? Because they want you dumb, deaf, ignorant, and stupid. That's why they promote hip hop as a culture because they want to identify you with just slavery and slavery only. You don't have a history. Your history starts at 1619. Now, if you've been on my page long enough, I don't just use black scholars. I use so-called white scholars as well, because most of our people believe what the so-called white man says about history. But when you look at some of their scholars, they're afraid or, you know, in at odds to admit certain truths. It's a trend you've no doubt read about. The growing list of books banned in our nation's classrooms and libraries. Martha Teichner takes us to the front lines of a war on words. I'm looking at Catch-22. Mm -hmm. 
Kurt Vonnegut's Cat's Cradle, The Great Gatsby. Classics. Every one of them banned in some places. The Chicago Public Library put them on display in defiance of efforts nationwide to ban books. There was somebody who objected to the profanity or the challenge to the status quo. Now, I did a freeze frame on this uh, segment when they went to certain books, but they uh, went to this book, The Awakening, the irony or, you know, the similarities of what we call in the so-called black community, the great awakening, right? But there's a difference between being awakening to the knowledge of certain truths, which is in the scriptures of who the biblical people are, the scriptures, okay? And being woke to liberal ideologies and so forth. But in the grand scheme of it all, we know that the, the Democrats are pretty much a Luciferian or a communist party, meaning what? They're using so-called black people as pawns, as well as the alternative lifestyle of the alphabet community. They try to equate one in the same. Deborah Caldwell Stone is director of the American Library Association's Office of Intellectual Freedom. Her job is to know what's being targeted. LGBTQIA books, books they deem to be critical race theory, but were actually books on the history of race, racism, slavery in the United States, or representing black voices, um, were overwhelmingly being targeted by these demands to remove books. Tomorrow, the American Library Association will announce the most challenged books of 2022. Yes, race, controversial aspects of history, vulgarity, and violence may be red flags found in a number of books already challenged or banned, but sex and gender are now overwhelmingly the subject matter being attacked. Parents, when they're sending their kids to school, uh, they should not have to worry about this garbage being in the schools. Ammunition for Florida's Republican Governor Ron DeSantis's War on Woke. So as I've stated earlier, there's a difference between woke and awakening. Now they try to equate being uh, gay, queer, or lesbian, you know, the alphabet community with uh, race, quote unquote, or black people's struggle. And they've done this since the civil rights with Martin Luther King who was not a quote-unquote Christian, just used the Bible as a prompt, and Bear Rushton, who was known for being uh, gay or alternative lifestyle. And we see this constant theme in different commercials and ads where they equate uh, blackness and, you know, alternative lifestyles. When, you know, in the 50s and 60s, our people did not accept that type of lifestyle. Books like Gender Queer, an intensely polarizing exploration of gender identity at the center of the book battles. It is a graphic novel, so certainly it's more in your face, but it's not intended to titillate. It's intended to provide a window onto one person's experience, not knowing their gender identity and needing to explore that. Between 2020 and 2022, the number of individual titles challenged spiked more than 1,100%, from just over 200 to more than 2,500. Since 2021, school districts have banned books in 37 states, with Florida and Texas leading the pack. These were organized efforts by groups of parents uh, arguing about parents' rights. Moms for Liberty soon came to prominence as a group that was driving a lot of book challenges in local communities. The book Gender Queer was in our school libraries. Had Moms for Liberty not brought that book to your attention, it might still be there. Now, I will say this. I know that there are a certain sects of Christians or conservatives, so-called white people, that inherently believe in the scriptures and they believe that the powers to be are trying to destroy or ban the book and this is true so whether they believe who the people are or not they're still trying to defend the book okay so we got to take that in consideration even though some of them don't know left and right from the scriptures but they do know one thing that that alternative lifestyle is not in accordance with God or the Most High. 
launched in 2021, the group now claims 275 chapters in 45 states with 115,000 members and counting. Never bet against a mom. I mean, nobody's going to defend anything like a mom is going to defend their child. Tiffany Justice and Tina Deskovich, both former Florida school board members, founded Moms for Liberty. We're joyful warriors. Joyful warriors. Their aim? To play hardball with a smile. We are organized, we are angry, and we know our rights. Enjoy the time we have left. We want people who are serving in elected office that respect the role of the parent in a child's life. So in 2022, our chapters endorsed in over 500 school board races across the country, and they won 275 seats. What kinds of books do you want in schools, in libraries? Books that educate children. That's a generalization that... that Books that don't have pornography in them. Let's start there. Let's just put the bar really, really low. Books that don't have incest, pedophilia, rape. Just my two cents. But the Bible or the Hebrew scripture, which is a book about law, history, and prophecy, the diary or the foretelling of the Israelites' journey with the Most High. But all what she said is in the scriptures. Stories of raping and pillage, incest, um, sex, murder, adultery, fornication, and so forth. All these are themes on which to educate the people or the nation of Israel following the Torah and the laws and following the Hamishiach because the Hamishiach taught the Torah. The books that don't have pornography in them, let's start there. Let's just put the bar really, really low. Books that don't have incest, pedophilia, rape. Stop it! It's, I mean, talk about Orwellian, you know, like calling this organization Moms for Liberty when it's actually for suppression is uh, about as basic as you could find in 1984, which I think is listed as a young adult novel still and probably has been banned in lots of places. Cartoonist Art Spiegelman. And on a side note, Spiegelman is a Jewish Ashkenaz surname, meaning what? Minstrel musician. Has been speaking out ever since the McMinn County, Tennessee School Board voted unanimously last year to ban Mouse, his Pulitzer Prize winning graphic novel about the Holocaust, citing violence, profanity, and because of this image, nudity. I think it's possible for an adult to say, I don't want my kid reading that book in class, but to forbid the other kids from reading it or taking it out of the library, that's not liberty. That's suppression and authoritarianism. Spiegelman says, fight back. Kick out the damn school boards and get school boards in that are, are more nuanced in what they're doing. Getting involved in local politics as necessary to try to protect libraries' fundings and um, schools' needs instead of making it such a low priority. You know, this idea of what's appropriate and inappropriate is so subjective, and, um, and teenagers are smart. Linda Johnson is president and CEO of the Brooklyn, New York Public Library. What we ended up doing was issuing a countrywide press release that said if you're between the ages of 13 and 21 and you can't find the material. Now right here we have a still shot, and it says books unite us, censorship divides, let freedom read. Notice how they try to tie in a lot of the communist or Marxist movements with the struggles or the plight of so-called black people. These liberals, white liberals, always do this. We see a pattern. There's a paper trail of why they do this. You know, like an old saying, let the pawns go first. And they use so-called black people to push their agendas. There are many whites who are trying to solve the problem, but you never see them going under the label of liberals. That, that white person that you see calling himself a liberal is the most dangerous thing in the entire Western Hemisphere. He's the most deceitful. He's like a fox. And a fox is, almost, is always more dangerous in the forest than the wolf. You can see the wolf coming. You know what he's up to. But the fox will fool you. He comes at you with his mouth shaped in such a way that even though you see his teeth, you think he's smiling and taking for a friend. So right here we have the raised fist. The raised fist or clenched fist is a long-standing image of mixed meaning, often a symbol of solidarity, especially with a political movement. It is also a common symbol of anti-fascism, socialism, communism. Keyword, communism. 
and archism and another revolutionary social movements. It can also represent a salute to express unity, strength, or resistance. Like the scripture states, there's nothing new under the sun. So right here we have this painting by Honoré Dumier of the French Revolution of 1848, or the Marxist revolutions of 1848, includes a possible early example of a political clenched fist. Like I've stated earlier, there's nothing new under the sun. The raised fist or clenched fist goes all the way back to ancient times. So right here we have the false deity Baal or Baal, god of fertility, weather, rain, wind, lightning, seasons, war, sailors. Solid cast bronze of motif figurine representing the god Baal or Baal discovered at Tel Medigo dating to the mid 2nd millennium BC. Symbol, bull, ram, thunderbolt, region, ancient Syria, especially Halab, near around and at Ugarit, Canaan, and North Africa. And the one thing that should catch your higher attention is the raised fist. This is where this comes from, right? Ancient culture or different false deities that the people worship at the time. Okay, but a lot of the stuff or a lot of the scripted events and narratives based in America or Hollywood because they they venerate the Canaanite religion, which includes human sacrificing, certain rituals and so forth. This is nothing new, though. So right here we have a bronze figurine of Baal or Baal, 14th, 12th century. As we can see, as above, so below, or the Marxist or clenched fist. So right here we have a couple of illustrations of the clenched or raised fist. The raised fist has traditionally been a sign of solidarity and unity, five fingers working together as one, but also of militancy and radicalism. As a historic symbol of left-wing movements, it dates back to the French Revolution. The labor movement in particular adopted the image with the fist often holding a tool. Like I've stated earlier in the video and Malcolm X as well, that these liberals use so-called black people as pawns for their political and social agendas. Oftentimes our people are caught up into these uh, activists or, you know, certain groups because of the plight of so-called black people because they've stripped away our culture, language, and heritage. Most of our people do not know who they are. We associate black with a history and culture, which it is not. Black is just a term for a corporate destination. Oftentimes our people uh, get mad at the ones who are telling the truth that are on the street corners, camps, or even online. And of course, there's always the old saying, ignorance is bliss. A lot of people want to be still caught up in this system or have the hopes and wishfulness of what the system could be. But we have to remember, America is just a social experiment, okay? And we know what's going to happen to America according to the scriptures. So it states, the origin of the raised fist as either a symbol or gesture is unclear. And that's not necessarily true. We know where the raised or clenched fist originates from. Its use in trade unionism and archism and the labor movement had begun by the 1910s. William Big Bill Haywood, a founding member of the industrial workers of the world, used the metaphor as a fist as something greater than the sum of its parts during a speech at the 1913 Patterson's Silk Strike. Journalist and socialist activist John Reed described hearing a similar description from a participant in the strike. A large raise rising from a crowd of striking workers was used to promote a mass strike in Budapest in 1912 in the United States. And clenched fist was described by the magazine Mother Earth as symbolical of the social revolutions in 1914. So it states the use of the fist as a salute by communists and anti fascists is first evidence in 1924 when it was adopted for the Communist Party of Germany's Rotter, I can't pronounce that last name, Alliance of Red Front Fighters. 
In reaction, the Nazi party adopted the well-known Roman salute two years later. The gesture of the raised fist was apparently known in the United States as well and is seen in a photograph from a May Day march in New York City in 1936. It is perhaps best known in this era from its use during the Spanish Civil War of 1936 through 1939 and as a greeting by the Republican faction and known as the popular front salute or the anti fascist salute. So right here we have uh, Caucasian or in the scriptures known as Edomites uh, preparing for an evacuation during the Spanish Civil War of the 1930s. Some giving the Republican salute. The Republicans showed a raised right fist, whereas the Nationalists gave the Roman salute. In the States, the graphic symbol was popularized in 1948. And we know what else happened in 1948. The Jewish people established the State of Israel. What a coincidence. It also states a simplified version for Student Nonviolence Coordinating Committee. This version was subsequently used by students for a democratic society and a Black Panther movement. One in the same. I repeat, one in the same. Marxist or communist groups. So now we're back at the revolutions of 1848 or the Marxist revolutions of 1848 were essentially democratic and liberal in nature with aiming of removing the old monarchical structures and creating independent nation states. So when we ruled over there in Europe, we had monarchs, nobles, nobility, blue blood, which just means uh, a Negro or a Moor, not what you think the blue blood means in this current society, blue veins, no. As envisioned by Romantic nationalism. The revolution spread across Europe after an initial revolution began in France in February. Over 50 countries were affected, but with no significant coordination or cooperation among their respective revolutionaries. Some of the major contributing factors were widespread dissatisfaction with political leadership, demands for more participation in government and democracy, demands for freedom of the press, other demands made by working class for economic rights and the upsurge of nationalism, the regrouping of established government forces and the European potato failure, which triggered mass starvation, migration and civil unrest. The uprisings were led by temporary coalitions of reformers and the middle classes, the upper classes, the black bourgeoisie and the workers. We know that Caucasians or the wild man during the Middle Ages, they didn't own land. They had to rent land. That's why they were known as slaves or Slavs, which is, you know, a Russian terminology, and serfs, serfism. Okay? They worked for the black nobility or the nobles in the medieval times. They couldn't even own land. That's where you get the landlord from, from black masters. Reading on, however, the coalitions did not hold together for long. Many of the revolutions were quickly suppressed, and as tens of thousands of people were killed, and even more were forced into exile. Now, during the 1700s, you had uh, rebellions, but also there's a book called The Jacobite Glanings, and a lot of the so-called Black Europeans, whether they were from Welsh, Saxon, or um, Frisian, or different lineages were shipped to the americas and different caribbean islands and so forth but they don't teach that they just teach that so-called black people are just from africa the west parts enslaved reading on the significant lasting reforms included the abolition of serfdom in australia and hungary and the end of the absolute monarchy in denmark meaning what the end of the black rulership Okay, and the introduction of representative democracy in the Netherlands. The revolutions were most important in France, in the Netherlands, in Italy, the Australian Empire, and the states of German Confederation that would make up the German Empire in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. The wave of uprising ended in October 1849.
Right here, we have the book, The Negro Question, Part 4, The Missing Link. King of Scots, right here is King James, a so-called black man. We have the Black Britons, the Black Irish, and so forth. Real good book by uh, Mr. Lee Cummings. Benjamin Franklin's essay, titled America as a Land of Opportunity, author Benjamin Franklin, the year is 1751. Subject, why increase the sons of Africa in America? Why should the Palatine Moors slash Germans, because the original Germans were so-called black or people of color, be suffered to swarm into our Pennsylvania settlements? They will never adopt our customs any more can they adopt our complexion, which is a mutation or white skin. Reading on, all of Africa, Asia, and America, except for us, are black, Russia, Italy, Spain, France, Swedes, and the Germans are black. These are the people that the eyewitness and Benjamin Franklin was complaining about when he said, why should Pennsylvania be colonized by the sons of Africa? grow in the Americas. Now that I have done your research for you, it should be apparent that he was talking about the blacks from Welsh, Ireland, and Scotland who were shipped to the slave colonies in the South and Pennsylvania. Let me tell you about black history. We are the original man. The first men on earth were black. They ruled and there wasn't a white face anywhere. But they teach us that we lived in caves and swung from trees. That's a lie. Black men never did that. We were a race of kings when the white man crawled around on all fours over the hills of Europe. And this is the movie uh, in the 90s, Malcolm X, starring Denzel Washington. Now, there is certain gems and certain truths that they talk about in this film. What he just said, that the so-called white man or wild man of the medieval ages crawled around on all fours. He was uncivilized and he was in a bestial state. But they don't teach this, right? They teach you that all the kings of Europe were so-called white and black were just running around in Africa swinging on trees with bones in their noses and ears and acting uncivilized or savages, right? Do they know who they are? Do you know where you came from? What's your name? I'm little. No. That's the name of the slave masters who own your family. And this scene was very pivotal for me because when I started to research surnames and where our last names come from, it was astonishing to know or come to find that those are genetically our last names, so to speak. But when we really look at it, according to the so-called Caucasian and some of these uh, radical or groups like Islam and so forth, even some of the Hebrew groups, that our names are from slaves. But when we look at the history of Europe or who the original Europeans were, that's not the case. So this is a false narrative that they try to teach our people that our last names are from so-called white people when in fact they get our names from us. You don't even know who you are. You're nothing, less than nothing. Who are you? Okay. <laughs> Even to this day, you know, in the year 2023, a lot of our people have not awakened him to who they are. And a lot of our people are stuck in religious or belief systems that they do not know or search out of where these practices, rituals come from. So the government knows that the so-called blacks here in the Americas are the aboriginal Indians or Negroes black Europeans and the West African Jews or Judeans. They know this history, but they will not teach it because it will uplift our people. And this is a psychological war. Why would you uplift the oppressed, right? All right, I ain't Malcolm Little, I ain't Red, I damn sure ain't Satan. That's right. So who are you? Who are you? Who are you? Um, we are a nation. And of course, I think he says the nation of Shabazz, but in all actuality, it's the nation of Israel, the 12 tribes. OK, that's who the so-called blacks or of the captive or captivity are. And I will say this. A lot of our people are genetically 
from the 12 tribes, but we're in different belief systems, different religions, and so forth. The tribe of Shabazz, is lost in this wilderness called North America. And in reference to lost tribes, the lost tribes of Israel, the 10 tribes, when you read the book of uh, second or first Ezra, I do believe it talks about the, uh, the 10 tribes that were carried over. So whoever made this film, the director, of course, they like to twist and turn, uh, you know, certain troops, but it's the tribes of Israel. Then he goes on to say that they would overrun the colony. Now take the spreadsheet showing the captives from Europe and match that with the captives coming out of Africa. And then you can see how the black European captives became the missing link among us. Add this information to the two great African-American migrations from the southern states of America to the northern states in America, 1910 to 1930 and 1940 to 1970. Now, both groups have been mingled together perfectly in the black community. So we have three stocks of the so-called blacks in the Americas, the black Europeans, or I should say the black aboriginals first, the Negro or Indian tribes the black Europeans, and then we have the West African uh, Judeans or Jews. Nobody knows that they are here because they have been mingled together and they look just alike. That's why our government um, promotes this slave narrative. They do not want you to know the origins or your real history. That's why they call us black. I have sat with some of the greatest minds in the ghetto and people that you will never see on television. People who have dedicated their entire life to knowing the truth or the knowledge and this was hidden from them. It is because of the invention of the internet that the real history of the world is beginning to emerge out of these royal libraries and national archives. Okay, but oftentimes the Luciferians or alternative lifestyles, they want to hijack the awakening okay woke is just a liberal term along with the internet the science of genetics has emerged to shield a great light on human trafficking between continents that which was once thought to be impossible has now become a reality now you are able to determine what part of the earth your family originated from without ships manifest or a written history of your lineage I say to you that even though this great light called genetics is shining brightly in its infancy, it cannot shine its brightest without the Negro question part for the missing link. Right here we have the chart captives from Europe, Scottish captives sent to Barbados, Boston, Charleston, Cambridge, Concord, and so forth. Irish captives sent to the Amazon 1612, the West Indies. Wales, captives sent to Pennsylvania, Connecticut, Idaho, Tennessee, Ohio, Rhode Island, etc. Use your brain for one moment. What do you think happened when these colonies became emancipated by the different colonial powers? These people began to mingle freely throughout the earth, and that is what happened right here in the United States. These people are among us, but no one knows they are here. To further illustrate my point, there is a story of a so-called African prince, um, James Albert, who was found on a slave plantation in St. John's. After he was freed, he went to London and then to the British slash Wales. I was also puzzled as to why he would go back to Europe as opposed to his kingdom in Africa. Why would he go to live with the slave master if he could return to his own family. And that's what they teach you in the narrative history over here in the Western civilization, that black equals slavery and white people equals slave master. Okay. They profit so much off of that narrative. And to break that narrative, a lot of these institutions, schools, churches would lose a lot of money. They're already losing money right now because our own people or our people are coming into the realization that the scriptures is talking about us. This made no sense to me, but now that I have this additional data, I understand. He was probably a captive taken from the whales who, after being free, returned to his place of birth, 
even though he has been misclassified as a quote unquote African prince. This is the problem with the concept that if you are black, you come from Africa. That simply is not true. If you have ever read the Negro Question Part 1, Who Am I? and the Negro Question Part 2, the African slave ships that came from Judah, Arthur Lee Cummings, you would see the information showing the blacks, the black-headed people from Mesopotamia, which in the scriptures is Babylon or Sumer, one of the five powers on the earth leading up to World War II was the black Japanese and I shall prove that in later chapters. Before I go any further, I would like to show you that the place in Europe where every nation had a port called the Slave Coast by the historians, but called the Kingdom of Judah by the royal map maker Emmanuel Bowen. Okay. And this is a map. Okay. The Levites, Judah. What do we see right here? Kingdom of Judah or wider, the Slave Coast. As we can see, I have this map here in my office, same thing, Negro land, okay, and right here, Kingdom of Judah, or Wada, the Slave Coast, okay, so they know our history, they know who we are according to scriptures. This map was created by the royal map maker Emmanuel Bowen in 1747 for two European kings, which were so-called black men. King George II of England and King Louis the 15th of France. When he got back to Europe, he told the two kings that the tribe of Levi was the Ashante and that the slave coast was the kingdom of Judah. This map is currently in the inventory of Northwestern University, uh, Evanston, Illinois. There is a book that was published by Louisiana State University called Creole New Orleans Race and Americanization, page 67. It states that six slave ships came from Judah dropping slaves at the mouth of the Mississippi, page 69, says one ship came from Judah and dropped off 464 slaves. Okay. If you've been on my page long enough, you've seen some videos on this book as well. Okay, let's go to page 69. Really, let's, let's just go to the chart first. Let's go to page 67. The African slaves brought to Cheek Speaks during the 18th century came mainly from the Bight of uh, Bafra and were heavily Ibo, meaning what? Hebrews. Okay. <clears throat> There was only a handful of black slaves in Louisiana before the first slave trading ships arrived from Africa in 1719, the year after New Orleans was founded. Between 1719 and 1731, 22 of the 23 slave trading ships that came from Africa while France ruled Louisiana arrived. Between June 1719 and January 1731, 16 slave trading ships arrived in Louisiana from the Senegal region, six ships came from Judah or Wida, a slave trading post on the Gulf of Benin near Dohomey, and one from Angola during the same period. The slave trade from Senegal intensified after 1725, but between 1726 and January 1731, 12 slave ships from Senegal landed, 3,259 slaves at Belize at the mouth of the Mississippi River. During the same period, one ship from Judah landed 464 slaves at the same port. Okay. Now let's go to the let's go to the chart. Okay. Origins and numbers of slaves brought from Louisiana from Africa 1719 through 1743. That's why we say that the so-called blacks here are Jews or what Israelites or Judeans, right? This is ethnicity. It's a nationality. This is not a religion. Okay. Year landed number of slaves, 1719, 1720, 1721, 1728. This is real history. Okay. 
If it's documented, you got to use a lot of discernment because you got all these uh, false narratives and and whatnot. So right here, we're at the chart. Start here. Slave ships leaving London ports carrying black European slaves. Two groups arrive in America, the blacks from Europe and the blacks from Africa. Ships landing in Africa carrying black Scots, black Irish, black Brits, pick up black Africans, Judah, Levi, and proceed to the Middle Passage. We're all intermixed. But these are the three groups, okay? Now we're going to go to Acts chapter 29. And this is not in the scriptures. But we also got to remember that they've taken out certain books like the Apocrypha. And when you read Ancient and Modern Britons, Volume 1, by David McRitchie, a so-called white man or Caucasian, now you understand who the original inhabitants of Britain, who they were, a mixture of Semitic and Hamitic and Japhetic peoples. So it states, verse 1, And Paul, full of the blessings of the Hamishiach, or Christ, and abounding in the spirit, departed out of Rome, and determining to go into Spain, for he had a long time proposed to journey that award, and was minded also to go from thence to Britain. Verse 2, For he had heard in Phoenicia that certain of the children of Israel about the time of the Assyrian captivity had escaped by sea to the isles afar off, as spoken be the prophet Ezerus, and called by the Romans Britain. If you follow the arrows, you will see that the European black slaves from Britain, Ireland, France, England, and Scotland left Europe and then proceeded to West Africa, where the black Jews from the kingdom of Judah was waiting. They picked up a second load of black slaves, and with both loads, two different blacks from two different hemispheres, because our phenotypes are in different lands, and proceeded to the markets in the Middle Passage, and from there, they went to the slave plantations in America. This historical omission of these people are now complete. It's like a card game, three card monte. The hustlers used to play this game on the trains in Chicago. A guy would get on the train with his friend and pretend to know each other. The other guy would take out a newspaper and put the three bent cards on top of the paper face down, the hustler would state that whoever could find the red card would receive $100. When the victim saw the hustler's friend win, he would put up his $100 to $200, and all of a sudden the hustler became a winner. It was the shuffle that deceived the victim, and it was the shuffle that deceived this modern historian. This time, the card dealer in history and the cards to be shuffled were flesh and blood human beings, the black Irish, the black Scots, the black Brits, the black French, the black Italians, and the black Jews from West Africa. The entire world fell for the shuffle, including me, and I thought I was sharp. All the blacks on both sides of the Atlantic had been shuffled and mingled together in this colony we call America. After all of the words that I write to you in the first three chapters of this book, this one image of cards being shuffled is what I have been trying to show you the entire time. This is the reason that the book was titled The Missing Link, because these people are missing from history and is making the science of genetics look like a fraud. I shall make this plain to you by the end of this book. As we can see right here, the shuffle. Black Irish, Black Britons, Black Italy, Black Scots, and Judah. Hollywood Shuffle, right? In just over a year since it launched Books Unbanned, the library has issued more than 6,200 free digital library cards and circulated over 100,000 books and other items. So, on the first day uh, of school, August 2022, um, my students walked into our classroom, all of our classroom library. Ladies and gentlemen, this is what this is truly about. It's not the empowerment of so-called blacks or, you know, to empower the people of the scriptures. It's for the Luciferians or the Caucasian elites to put their ideologies and their God, Pan, or whatever deity that they serve. And we're telling us through 
the Marxist or the Communist Manifesto, but also they use blacks, as I stated earlier, as pawns to uh, further their agendas. Shelves were covered over, and in their place was the book's unbanned QR code. Summer Boimier was a 10th grade English teacher in Norman, Oklahoma, when she did that. After being told to pull books that might violate a new state law prohibiting Oklahoma schools from teaching uncomfortable aspects of race or sex. Now, I did a still shot of this frame, and it states race or sex. As I stated earlier in the video, they try to correlate the two. They're one and the same. So they don't teach the real history of the so-called black race. And there's no such thing as a black race. Race just means seed line. But the phenotypes or the groups here in the Americas, the Aboriginals, the black Europeans, and the West African Judeans. But oftentimes they use these certain communist or Marxist groups to further in their own agendas. And oftentimes they don't even need the so-called white liberal to complain about uh, injustice or equality. They just get the black liberals to do that. And they want a hug from the so-called white man. All it takes is one objection for any reason. A school district could lose its accreditation. A teacher could lose their ability to teach in not only an Oklahoma classroom, but any K-12 classroom in the country. Boamier was removed from her classroom, accused of distributing pornography for posting the QR code. She resigned before being fired. You know, I am incensed. I'm livid. I'm not heartbroken. Identities are not obscenities. Stories are not pornography. They're possibility. Now, she works for the Brooklyn Public Library. As we can see in this still shot, we have the so-called white lady or Caucasian of the uh, alternative lifestyle or the alphabet community. And what do we have here? BLM, Black Lesbians Matter. Excuse me, Black Lives Matter, right? So oftentimes they try to associate themselves with the plight or struggle of so-called black people. And the top of the pecking order in this society is the Caucasian Jew. The Caucasian, the liberal white woman, the liberal black woman, and the dog of the society or protector is the so-called black man. And we see this in certain films. The Magical Negro, Morgan Freeman, Denzel Washington, Will Smith, and uh, many of others have played the Magical Negro. Okay, Richard Fryer in the movie Toy. Now, if you watch the movie Equalizer or Equalizer 3, you see this. As Denzel Washington, his character, McCall, tries to protect and uphold other people of not of his own progeny. And he's pretty much the security guard or security dog of the so-called uh, Caucasians. With teens, as part of Books Unbanned. I made the calculation, uh, knowing that it could possibly cost me my job, knowing that it could possibly cost me my teaching certificate um and that is a hill that i'm willing to die on in a war where bookshelves are battlefields and both sides want to capture the same flag it sounds melodramatic but you know to do something which inhibits intellectual curiosity is like a death knell for democracy our moms and dads are very concerned about the future of the country and they're willing to step up however they need to to fight for the survival of America. And I'll end this video on this note. The survival of America, well lady, all you have to do is read the Hebrew scriptures in context. It shows you what's going to happen to America and what is going to happen to a certain type of people. It's already been prophesied. The Caucasian elites or the Caucasian Jews already know this. OK, the Democratic and the Republican are nothing but a horn on the same devil. OK, polar opposites attract the one in the same. OK, oftentimes the truth is usually in the gray area, meaning what it's in the middle, the black and the white, 
but oftentimes the truth or the knowledge is in the middle, a three-dimensional or maybe a fourth-dimensional point of view. So we have to not veer to the right or veer to the left, right?